Thank you very much and good morning. Each year around the world, about three and a half million people sustain an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. On average, just less than one in 10 survive that cardiac arrest to go home from hospital. There are key interventions, as we've just heard from uh, Tony Walker, that we can all do in order to optimize and improve the chances of survival. Early recognition of cardiac arrest and activating the emergency services. Early bystander CPR increases your chance of survival two to threefold. Defibrillation, if it can be administered within the first five minutes of cardiac arrest, greater than a 50% chance survival to discharge. What do you do if all else fails? What do you reach for in the event that those early attempts at resuscitation have been unsuccessful? Right. Come on, man, hurry up, fuck. Okay, okay, okay. I think it's ready. Two. Helpful or harmful? <laughs> Adrenaline is exciting. Can you feel the rush? I mean, it's exhilarating. Uh, it gets your heart pumping. It's, it's something people feel engaged with. But the question uh, that we put before you is how helpful or harmful is adrenaline as a treatment for cardiac arrest? The Paramedic 2 study showed that it took 112 people, uh, or you had to treat 112 people to get one survivor, but we found no difference uh, or, or no evidence of a difference in terms of improvement of a favorable neurological outcome after cardiac arrest following the use of adrenaline. So the hypothesis, ladies and gentlemen, that has been put to me is to discuss the case uh, that adrenaline is dead, what next? Uh, and to um, consider what we do with the next steps. Now, we're going to have a go at the, um, the, the Slido, or we may have a go at the Slido, so I'm keen to know what uh, the audience thinks. So if you could uh, re rehearse whether, you think, uh, whether you're an adrenaline junkie uh, or whether you think adrenaline is dead. Okay, so we've got 60-40. Well, let me move forward to the, uh, the, the position that the International Liaison Committee for Resuscitation are currently consulting on, uh, and that is that we recommend the administration of adrenaline during CPR as a strong recommendation based on low to moderate certainty of evidence. Now, ILCOR are currently consulting uh, on their summary of science and treatment recommendation at the URL at the top there, costar.ilcor.org. And I'd encourage everybody to go and look at that and to feed back to ILCOR your thoughts and reflections on the, the summary of science and treatment recommendation. Perhaps before we do that, I'd just like to walk you through some of the historical background to the use of, of adrenaline. It was nearly 150 years ago uh, that Palancy and, and colleagues uh, minced up adrenaline from uh, one animal and injected it into another animal in order to see what, uh, what effect it had. They noted that it increased cardiac contractility, it increased uh, blood pressure, and it increased heart rate. The adrenal extract was then tried in an experimental model of shock, and it was able to restore blood pressure after uh, the experimental induction of shock. Krill was the first to use it in cardiac resuscitation, uh, and in a series of experiments showed that adding adrenaline alongside manual or, and invasive uh, CPR was able to achieve a return of spontaneous circulation with greater certainty than when it wasn't used. Adams was one of the first to use adrenaline in humans in cardiac arrest. In an intraoperative cardiac arrest, he injected intracardiac adrenaline and after 20 minutes of resuscitation achieved a return of spontaneous circulation. Pearson and Redding uh, 
credited for identifying the mechanism, the primary mechanism through which uh, adrenaline appears to have a, a benefic beneficial effect on the heart, and that through stimulation of alpha receptors. Peter Saffer was one of the first to introduce uh, adrenaline as part of a treatment algorithm for cardiac arrest, and it was incorporated into US guidelines uh, back in 1974 and has continued to sit in international resuscitation guidelines since that point. If we look at the evidence prior to undertaking the Paramedic 2 study, it's summarized here. Uh, it's about 600,000 patients uh, that were from in a majority of observational studies, but also the one previous uh, randomized controlled trial taking place here in Australia, led by Ian Jacobs. And this slide summarizes the evidence prior to Paramedic 2, uh, a consistent effect at improving return of spontaneous circulation but uncertainty uh, around the effect on survival to discharge and a signal suggesting uh, that adrenaline was harmful uh, in terms of survival with a favorable neurological outcome. The Paramedic 2 was a large randomized placebo-controlled trial that was conducted in the UK. It was funded by the National Institute for Health Research and we're grateful for their support and also the support from London, North East, South Central, Welsh and West Midlands ambulance services, without whom the trial wouldn't have been possible to complete. The trial recruited adult patients who sustained an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest where advanced life support was initiated or continued by paramedics that had been trained in the research protocol. The research protocol was based around the European Resuscitation Council guidelines at the time which recommended the use of adrenaline in shock refractory VF, so after three attempts at defibrillation or in patients with non-shockable rhythms after initiating CPR, obtaining vascular access and starting airway management. I bring you to this slide which is the consort flow diagram, not to talk through the detail of the consort diagram but to actually draw several key points to your attention. Firstly, this was not a trial of adrenaline in all patients that sustain a cardiac arrest. This was a trial of adrenaline in patients that were refractory to the initial interventions of CPR and attempts at defibrillation. Our UK and other registries and the data from previous randomized controlled trials shows that you anticipate the survival rate in this refractory group is approximately 3%. We randomized just over 8,000 patients of the trial uh, and had good, uh, good follow-up for our primary outcome of survival to 30 days. In terms of the outcomes, okay, well, the outcomes haven't translated onto the, uh, the slide, but we saw a three-fold increase uh, in the rate of return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, we saw a three-fold increase in the proportion of patients uh, admitted to hospital. By contrast, we saw a 0.8% difference uh, in survival to 30 days, but we didn't find evidence of a difference in survival with a favorable neurological outcome. We examined a series of uh, subgroups and we found no interaction suggesting that any particular subgroup, the treatment effect differed in terms of the uh, effect on 30-day survival. Now, I think this slide is informative to help us consider the, almost the paradox between uh, improved survival to 30 days, but no improvement in survival with a favorable neurological outcome. And you can bring those two pieces of information together by noting that the increase in uh, survival that is seen is represented uh, by a proportion of patients with worse neurological outcomes. And I think if you look at the top, there were 36 more uh, survivors overall. But if you look, this is the modified ranking scale down the left-hand side of the, uh, the scale. Uh, then there were a larger number, there were 27 patients, uh, more patients that had uh, moderate or severe uh, disability in the adrenaline-treated group. So uh, again, I think the um, slide hasn't quite projected as, uh, as intended, and I think for that reason I'll, I'll actually uh, move forward from this slide. But I think that the purpose of this slide was to walk you through in a UK setting where about 75% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest receive adrenaline. Uh, it leads to about uh, 5,500 uh, extra admissions to hospital each year. 
And as you follow that stepwise sequence through, um, if my memory serves me correct, it's about another 1,500 intensive care admissions. There's around about 5,000 uh, intensive care bed days uh, that uh, occur as a consequence of the use of adrenaline. And we see approximately 68 additional survivors uh, with a favorable neurological outcome and about 130 or 140 patients, uh, additional survivors with an unfavorable neurological outcome. So I think the future role of adrenaline is potentially it's a matter of, of, of balancing. I think it's about considering the uh, uh, effect, the significant effect and improvement on, on survival. Uh, it increases the proportion of patients that are admitted to hospital. That gives families the chance to say goodbye uh, to people that they were close to, uh, and it increases or it provides an opportunity for organ procurement uh, that wouldn't occur in the event that resuscitation was discontinued at scene. But at the same time as that one needs to consider the potential burden or the burden of disability and also the cost and impact on the health system as a whole. So in terms of thinking what next, I think uh, there have been a number of studies exploring alternative therapies, high dose adrenaline uh, and the use of either vasopressin or mixing adrenaline and vasopressin. And our recent Cochrane review has found no uh, additional um, impact on long term outcomes from the use of high dose adrenaline or vasopressin. So I think it brings us back to almost where we started, which is to, to look at the treatments that we know are effective in cardiac arrest. And these are very much front-loaded in the front part of the chain of survival. So I think we need to start looking forward to technologies, and we've already heard Tony Walker talk about the success in Ambulance Victoria, but how can we use technology to enhance and improve uh, uh, survival and, and, and the answer is we can use technology to mobilize the, the community. How can we get defibrillators to patients more rapidly uh, than the current systems allow us to? How can wearable technologies uh, uh, assist us? <laughs> and I think you know, we, we, we have seen uh, a, a series, you know, at the current time the Apple Watch uh, can identify somebody falling to the, the floor. There are algorithms that have used wearable watches to diagnose atrial fibrillation. So how far are we from uh, the, the, the fact that the watch can detect a fall, it can analyze the underlying heart rhythm, uh, it can detect the presence of ventricular fibrillation, call the emergency services, send your location, send your medical ID from your iPhone, and then um, how long before if you can afford two Apple watches? <laughs> It will give you your timely shock. So when a patient is in uh, refractory cardiac arrest, of course, one needs to consider alternatives. And I think uh, the, the role of eCPR uh, is evolving. I think we're still not entirely clear about the precise indications and, and timelines for the initiation of this treatment. But it offers an alternative to uh, manual CPR. I think we also need to shift the focus from the heart and onto the brain. So indeed, as, as Peter Saffer first envisaged, that we truly do deliver cardiocerebral resuscitation. Uh, and we need to increase uh, our approach to uh, resuscitation of the brain. And I think that can take a number of different perspectives. I think it can take the perspective of personalized medicine, where we have a better understanding of the etiology of cardiac arrest and potentially a better understanding of the flow to the different vital organs so that we can tailor our treatment to the individual physiological needs of the patient. Once we've achieved return of spontaneous circulation, we need to know what physiological state to return the patient to in order to optimize and improve the chances of, of survival. Uh, we need to know which sugar level, which oxygen level, what uh, effect do, do we have for, for hypercapnia. But perhaps most importantly, we need to consider brain rescue therapies. And there really is a, a dearth or an absence of effective brain rescue therapies uh, that can stop leading to the situation that we can restart the heart but not save the brain. So ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my talk uh, by restating the hypothesis to you. Uh, adrenaline is dead. What next? And look forward to the, the future providing us with solutions that are really going to transform the care that we can provide for patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Gavin, 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 please hold up. Gavin, 
Sorry, it's Craig from Smack Force News. Hey, Gavin. Oh, we've got a couple of questions. Gavin, please, please stand. We need to ask you these questions. Gavin, I, I speak on behalf of our, our, our viewership, um, which is mainly paramedics. You know, the guys that you, you were talking about just now? We've got some serious questions for you about this whole adrenaline story. So um, one of my viewers wanted to know, surely, surely you can't expect us paramedics, highly trained and all of that, to just do nothing. I mean, we've been giving this adrenaline for years now. What do you suppose we give? Um, is there something else? Can we give a different drug? Should we be giving adrenaline at lower doses, maybe through infusions? Would something like that help better than giving boluses of one milligram? So, so I think it's, it's a great, uh, great question. And I think you know, the, the first and foremost thing is, is that one of the key things with cardiac arrest is a team approach. It's not about an individual deciding that they're going to do one thing and, and other people aren't. Otherwise, that, that concept of a cardiac arrest algorithm and people working together isn't going to work. So the decisions need to take place outside of the heat of a, a cardiac arrest. I think there need to be discussions with the wider community about the overall costs and, and benefits uh, and making a system level decision uh, about when to use adrenaline. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think you've touched on some of those. Would lower doses uh, of adrenaline potentially have an effect? Quite possibly, we don't know. Similarly, infusions, uh, are, are they going to be any, any better than the one milligram boluses that are the current standard of care? I think we don't know the answers to those questions. And I think, reflecting back to the personalized medicine aspect, of course, different, the concept behind adrenaline is that it raises aortic diastolic pressure. But we're giving this blindly to these, these patients, not knowing which patients may actually benefit uh, or otherwise from adrenaline therapy. So I think there are some more, re you know, there's a, a great need for some more research to work out what the role of, of vasopressors is and at how much to give and at what point to transition to other therapies. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, uh, our, next, our next viewer wanted to know. Um, he, he just, he, he's slightly questioning your, your, your ability to uh, relate this research into practice. Um, one of your exclusion criteria was patients that's pregnant. Uh, my, my, my viewership is saying we don't do pregnancy tests before we start resus. So how did you practically exclude these patients from your research? And if you found that they were possibly pregnant afterwards, what did you do? How, how, how do we exclude them and why did you do so? So, so they were excluded for regulatory reasons. Uh, the EU regulations don't allow you to do research in, in people that are pregnant and, unless it's specifically in the context of relating to the pregnancy. And so if the answers can be got from conducting the research in, in a different situation, then they won't allow you to uh, enroll uh, people that are pregnant. Um, I think the trial was a pragmatic trial and it has to reflect the reality of, of, of pre-hospital care. Certainly pregnancy tests weren't uh, possible. We were reliant on the, the, the paramedics' judgment, but each of those exclusions that we had there, we had somebody or more than one person in each of those exclusions recruited to the trial for the very reason that you say people weren't aware uh, at the time that that was the situation. Okay, thank you. And then our final question from, from, from our audience and our viewers is, um, in terms of sustainability, do you, do you know of any service out there that's currently not using adrenaline for cardiac arrest? And if we had to make this change, if we had to tell paramedics, please don't use adrenaline, how, how would we relate this knowledge? How would we actually take this policy and implement it into our services? So, so I guess, firstly, the question, you know, one needs to come to a policy decision a, a, a around adrenaline, and I think it's not going to be as simple as simply considering return of spontaneous circulation survival. It probably needs to take a, a, a broader patient and health service uh, perspective. Uh, I am aware that there are some EMS agencies in, in the US uh, that have stopped using uh, adrenaline. I think Seattle, if I understand correctly, uh, and I'm sure they'll correct me if, if I'm wrong, have, have dropped down to using 0.5 milligram uh, doses of, of adrenaline. And I think they've looked at the impact that that's had uh, and noted that their survival rates remain fairly, uh, fairly similar. Okay, thank you. Um, Gavin, is there anyone that you would like to thank tonight? 
Well, firstly, I'd like to thank all of the, the paramedics and, and patients that took part in the, uh, in the trial. And then I'd like to say a quick hi to the kids, uh, Emily and Sam. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. Hey, Emily and Sam, hello. Uh, it's not the Sam up there. Um, thank you for stop avo stopping avoiding us. Uh, we appreciate that you took our questions eventually. My pleasure.